So, you've probably noticed by now a uh, gentleman to my right with a funky eye thing with a very peculiar blue thing that makes noise in front of him. Um, Steve Mann, he has a name, <laughs> is an inventor, the author of Cyborg Digital D Destiny, published by Random House. He has his PhD from MIT in humanistic intelligence. He's a professor at the University of Toronto, and he also has the singular distinction by now the Globe and the National, oh, Globe and Mail then, and the National Post as the world's first cyborg. I think I'm going to let him explain a little bit more about what that entails. So please welcome Steve Mond to the stage for me. Yes, thank you. Thank you to Michael and everybody else. It's a, it's a real, real honor to speak here. It's lots, lots of fun to be here. And so I'm going to talk about uh, humanistic intelligence. Um, now, is the singularity now, or is it long now, or will it ever occur? Um, if we follow Moore's law with an exponential growth, of course, um, there's no uh, singular singularity or asymptote in the, in the real uh, time in the finite real time axis, but perhaps you know there's a hyper hyperbolic growth that might be brought on by positive feedback, and hyperbolic growth, of course, you have an asymptote somewhere in the fin a finite value of time for which the the in the range for which the domain becomes approximately infinite. Uh, things like population and queuing theory, some certain phenomenology observe this this kind of asymptotic uh, result that may arise from positive feedback. And so I'll talk a little bit about feedback as well. Um, feedback occurs, of course, for example, when machines can replicate themselves. Uh, I, th these eyeglasses, I bought a milling machine to make uh, these various eyeglasses. And it's, one interesting thing about a milling machine is it's one of the few machines that can self-replicate. With a milling machine, you can make another milling machine. Of course, it takes a human in the feedback loop. But of course, you could have an automated milling machine that could make itself. Um, and uh, certainly in AI, I.J. Good in 1965, Werner Vinge 1982 uh, talked about these uh, AI machines that can self-replicate. Um, now one of the things that I'm interested in is kind of what are the greatest challenges and opportunities that face humankind? Not merely technology, but rather uh, a, a, a both deeper and broader outlook. Um, and uh, I've, I've come up with a, a framework, a theoretical framework, what I call humanistic intelligence, or HI. And I'm interested in a humanistic context that requires more than just, say, computer programming. But what is it fundamentally that informs us about the human condition? Um, for example, uh, Leonardo, say, you know, is often said to be the greatest engineer of all, all time. But he was, he was also uh, an artist, a scientist, and an inventor. And I'm, I find, I'm trying to draw inspiration from this kind of thought. Uh, you know, not, not merely trying to solve a problem, but trying to get people to look at the world differently. Um, let me present a more modern example, the work of Danny Hillis. Danny Hillis once said, I want to build a clock that ticks once every year and chimes once every century, and each millennium the cuckoo would come out. <laughs> when I read that, I was just totally blown away by it. It was very profound. I couldn't sleep that night. You know, it, was, it, was, it really got my mind going. And those, those are the kinds of people I really admire because they're bold and courageous to tackle a problem that most people would say is perhaps useless or not needed, or at least to invent a problem which really challenge us as, challenges, us, challenges us and makes us think. Let us think a lot about time. I mean, the time axis is what the singularity is all about in many ways. Um, so not just to solve problems, but as, as Baldwin would say, the purpose of art is to lay bare questions that have been hidden by the answers. So now, um, I'm, I've been fascinated by time in many ways. And, and so capturing time, capturing one's whole life. Um, and, and of course, for the last 30 years, I've been wearing computers attached to my body that capture my physiologicals, including the electrovisuogram, which is the eye, and the electrocardiogram, and the electroencephalogram, and all those things into a wearable computer. And of course, processing all that data and doing all kinds of interesting experiments in that world. Um, now, artificial intelligence 
has this, this, this possible singularity that may or may not occur. And even if, if there is an asymptote, we don't know when it is. It might be a long way from now. One thing I think that will happen before then is surveillance is very pervasive. In other words, intelligence, amplification by other, by, by other humans. And what, um, what we might have to be cautious of, one of the things that I've been concerned about, one of the things that concerns me more than just um, AI is, is, this, is surveillance, because it presents a really more clear and present danger, um, perhaps, uh, the pervasive surveillance. So surveillance is all around us, and people have raised privacy concerns of surveillance. You know, surveillance is often used in, in certain applications everywhere just to watch over people. Here's an example, you know, the sort of coastal imaging along uh, beach fronts, you know, surveillance cameras that watch people on the beach to make sure they're safe and that they don't drown. And the same thing happens in public baths, you know, surveillance systems in public bathing facilities to keep people safe. And of course, sensor operated fixtures, you know, we have your computer vision in the hand wash faucet that does object se segmentation and recognition and, and turns on the tap with an infrared sensor array. Uh, you've got the, the intelligent toilets that, that um, with the sensor array that, that provides automatic flush and so on. And so various forms of these technologies of infrared sensors and so on, and they provide a very useful role um, with intelligent vision, but the intelligence has this pervasiveness that tends to infuse in many aspects of society. And so what I, uh, I was kind of bothered by this a little bit, so I said, well, what, is, what could counteract that um, surveillance? And so I kind of made up a new word, the opposite. Surveillance is a French word. Sur means to watch from above, and vele means to watch. Sur means from above and vele means to watch. So I said, what's the opposite in French? Sou, meaning le contraire, de surveillance, say surveillance, meaning to, to watch from below. And so this pole with the camera on top, on the left-hand side there, represents um, a, a, a very, a very much, um, uh, you know, right, right, this, the camera up there represents a kind of um, uh, surveillance watching over. And then I, I had this notion of, uh, well, I had the eyeglasses, but I also, not everybody wants to wear eyeglasses. So I made this necklace thing. And this is a picture I took back in, in uh, 1998. And so surveillance versus surveillance. Surveillance is a God's eye view from above. Surveillance is human view from down to earth. Uh, surveillance cameras mounted on poles, ceiling, surveillance cameras on people. Uh, basically, sur surveillance is architecture-centered and surveillance is human-centered. And so that was one kind of t take on this, a look at, at things that think. Now, we have things that think. We have smart floors, smart toilets, smart light switches, smart elevators. How about smart people? I said, what happens if you have smart people? And I thought that might be an interesting idea to explore the, the new concept of smart people. And so... I had this theory of humanistic intelligence, and kind of in a nutshell, humanistic intelligence, or HI, if I denote the person as, as being um, a circular object and the, and the computer as being something like this, HI is intelligence that arises by having the human being in the feedback loop of the computational process. The wearable computer, for example, is an example of HI. The human being is here, and uh, the computer observes the output from the human and, and, and feeds back on it. And then, of course, the signal flow passes through. So in, in, in my book, Intelligent Image Processing, I um, put forth this theory that I call humanistic intelligence, or HI. Um, and I believe that that will happen much before the singularity. It already has happened in some ways, humanistic intelligence. Um, I took some of these ideas down to MIT, and, and amongst, among people I was very moved by were Marvin Minsky, he was on my thesis committee, and Nicholas Negroponte, the director of the lab. I found, I found these people very inspiring, and, and, uh, and this, is, this is just a little excerpt from, from Nicholas Negroponte, the director of the lab, describing this kind of um, wearable computing. Totally different. It's, 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 it's a very, very different time for us. Steve Mann was uh, 
building wearable computers in high school. And I think it's it's perfectly good example that here's a young man that brought with him an idea that was very much on the lunatic fringe, was very much something that people thought, well, this is kind of weird and it doesn't really make sense. And when he arrived here, a lot of people sort of said, wow, this is very interesting, and faculty became more interested, and he, and it's a, I think it's probably one of the best examples we have of where somebody brought with them an extraordinarily interesting seed, and then it sort of, you know, it grew, and there are many people now, so-called cyborgs in the media lab, and uh, people working on wearable computers all over the place. So there's, there's this, this was a lot of fun, bringing this idea. Now, the director of the lab, Nicholas, loved it. Marvin Minsky loved it. Um, but there was, there was one professor who didn't like it and wanted to shut me down. And he said, oh, you're, I, I can't allow you to, to, to do that here. And I said, OK, uh, I am, I'm me. You know, this is, this is kind of, it's an existential me. This is, I come equipped with this computer system that's attached to me. But I'll simply refrain from coming into the lab if it bothers you. And I can do my research at home or on the public streets because I don't really need any lab equipment to do my research because I am my own research machine. Um, but then he said I'm, I'd be embarrassed if, if somebody's picture got captured and transmitted, so we, we can't allow you to do this through MIT network. And I said, that's no problem. I, I, I've got lots of other people willing to donate bandwidth because they value this. Um, but then he tried to, to shut me down by, uh, by calling a bunch of privacy advocates in. And it's funny because the whole, one of the reasons I was motivated to do this is to raise questions about privacy. But anyway, um, uh, so he brought in, one of the people he brought in was Mitch Kapoor of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Privacy Commissioner and, and uh, uh, the, pri the Privacy Director. And, and Kapoor uh, sort of saved, uh, I, I credit Kapoor with really sort of saving, having the foresight to, to see, see this as value because he stood up and said, oh, uh, um, you know, I, 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 this is good, you know, this is, this is, Steve's doing some performance art and some scientific pursuit and, and if there's any place that ought to embrace this, it would be MIT. So in, in some sense he saved uh, this uh, from being kind of shut down or slowed down. Um, so, and, and I was very inspired by his material. I took, took one of his courses and, and he was an important uh, guiding light in my, in my thinking. Um, now, the technology, a lot of people ask me specifically about the technology, so I've filed a number of patents and so on. The ITAP invention, the ITAP device, it's spelled E-Y-E-T-A-P, it's a device that causes the eye itself to function as if it were in effect both a camera and a display. And the way that it works is there's a sort of 45 degree um, splitter. I've got another ITAP frame here. And if you look at one of these ITAP devices, you can probably see right along here, there's this 45 degree um, diverter, it's a two-sided mirror that diverts rays of eyeward bound light. So if this, if this was, if your eyes here, rays of light that were going to come towards your eye are instead diverted by that 45 degree mirror beam splitter into a, a, a camera or imaging system. If you look at somebody who's wearing an eye tap, it looks like they have a glass eye because the camera is exactly where their eye is. And then, um, the, there's a computer-controlled laser light source over here that re-renders, goes through a computer system processor, and then it re-renders and laser light everything that you would have seen, and then like this. So I, I call this mediated reality. Now this has evolved over the years. Um, uh, there's, this is how it was many years ago. And, and I've been doing this for about 30 years now. And it's evolved to sort of normal looking eyeglasses. In the 1990s, I got it to looking like normal eyeglasses. Now we're working on implanting it inside the body. I'm working with a couple of different filmmakers, different people who have vision only in one eye. And we're putting them right inside the eye as a seeing aid. Um, some of my, the inventions that I've been working on are cyborg logging and lifelong capture. Uh, Martine Rothblatt, I gave the keynote address at Future Persons in and, and, and there, and we talked about that, and I'm trying to collaborate with people like that. Um, uh, humanistic intelligence, brain contr control, int uh, 
um, the, the brain computer interface BCI. Um, we have the occipital lobe. I've been pl I play around a lot. I've been playing around with wearable, implantable, dermal, implantable type technologies and things like that. And I'm interested in BCI. One of the things that I developed out of that work is the chirplet transform. It's a mathematical framework that uses chirps. We all know harmonic analysis, waves and wavelets. Um, basically, a wave is you know like a Fourier basis, sines and cosines, and then a wavelet is a piece of a wave. I came up with something called a chirplet, which is a, analogously a piece of a chirp and I came up with something I called the chirplet transform. If you look at something simple like this picture of the building, um, there's periodicity, but periodicity in perspective, if I look up at the lights, they chirp, the frequency changes, or I look at the people, the, as, as, as I get higher in the, in, the, in the audience here, the spatial frequencies increase, so they're not uniform. We use this for BCI, actually, because brain waves often evolve from, say, alpha state to beta state. It doesn't snap, or, uh, doesn't stay in one state, it, it glides or moves from one state to another. Uh, we formed a, a little company that does brain computer interface called Interaxon. You, you know, this, this research that we did at the university and other areas, this kind of stuff. Interaxon is a leader in thought controlled computing. Thought controlled computing has a vast future, and in many senses, the future is now. The attraction here at the Ontario House at the Vancouver 2010 Olympics, the world's largest thought controlled computing installation, works by allowing visitors from all over the world to control. So, so I, don't, I won't play that, uh, all of that, but we had this, we had this at the Vancouver Olympics um, showing the, the, our brain BCI. Um, another project is this, is this sort of sense cam thing. Um, I, I came up with this neck worn thing, just very easy for people who didn't want to have eyeglasses and it. it's a fisheye lens neck worn camera with a bunch of uh, sensors in it and everything. And, and um, this picture I took in, in, in 1998. In 2004, Gordon Bell asked me to give the keynote at an event that he was doing there, and I showed this and some other stuff, related material. And um, now uh, Microsoft makes a, a similar neck-worn camera, um, kind of like this, although not in the dome, but it's a sim similar idea. Um, what I'm really interested in, in addition to the passage of time and, and so on, and humanistic intelligence, uh, various kinds of, 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 of sensors. One, another thing that came out of this work is high dynamic range imaging. This is the United States patent 5828793 that I filed while I was at MIT, which is HDR, high dynamic range imaging. You walk around, you see the world differently as you look up at the lights, you know, the camera gains down, and when you look into dark areas, the camera gains up. You take all these overlapping images of different gains and, and stitch them all together, you can see that you get the super high resolution capture of reality. So just by walking around, you build a super high resolution map of reality inside this computer database. So we're just wearing the computer here and there. I kind of had this notion. And of course, you can do, you don't have to have a wearable camera. You can do it with a handheld. Um, and then um, I want to, to talk a, a little bit about um, some fluid media. Um, what, what is it, uh, what, what I find very, very interesting is, is, is this notion of, of fluidly continuous media. Um, I, I call this the undigital singularity. Um, and by undigital singularity, I mean people talk about digital technology. In 1995, I wrote a paper for IEEE IST called, entitled Being Undigital. It was kind of a counterpoint to Nicholas Negroponte's book entitled Being Digital. And uh, I admire Nick Negroponte, by the way. I, I, I really like him, so I don't mean this in a negative way, but I was being kind of playful. And I, so I wrote this paper entitled Being Undigital. And I came up with this concept that I call the undigital singularity. And by that, what I mean is what I'd been doing for the last 30 years with Cyborg Log is streaming my life eff effortlessly without conscious thought or effort to the internet and sharing my experiences. Back in, in 1994, I had about uh, 30,000 people a day inside my head. Up until about 1994, I was open, no password or anything. Anybody could step inside my head and see whatever I was looking at any time of the day or night and annotate my retina. So I had write access and read access to my retina so people could scribble messages on my retina while I was walking around. And at that time, it started to drive me a little crazy to have 30,000 voices a day in my head. So I had to come up with ways of moderating a little bit. But what, what I thought here is this undigital singularity. Uh, the, the cyborg log, or glog for short, cyborg log, 
or if we abbreviate that, just the last four letters of the word cyborg log is just glog. Similar, and blog is also a short form for weblog. Uh, blogging was conscious thought or effort, and it was digital. It was a discrete alphabet of text. And glogging was more undigital, and it was a continuous free-flowing. The undigital singularity, I state simply as follows. As the word length increases without bound, the step size approaches zero, okay? Now, if the word length increased linearly, the step size would decrease exponentially. In other words, the signal to noise ratio would increase exponentially. And so that's kind of like Moore's law. Um, but you have to bear in mind that computers are getting faster exponentially. So then the, step, the word length is increasing more than linearly. Now, if we hypothesize that there might be a, a, a hyperbolic uh, growth in the word's length, then we get the undigital singularity. Um, if the word length increases linearly, now so undigital singularity when, the, when uh, basically for all practical purposes, we're going to hit a point fairly soon when the step size becomes smaller than the smallest subatomic quanta of physicality or at least the smallest quanta of human perception thereof. Um, so that's why our research group, uh, uh, Fluid Lab, we call ourselves FL and capital UI, because it stands for User Interface. Fluid stands for Flexible Limitless User Interface Devices. It's an acronym, Fluid Lab. Makes human interfaces that are undigital, i.e. fluid media. Now, Ryan Jansen uh, will present a specific example of an undigital interface. Uh, Ryan, do you want to come up and just, just say a few words about the undigital interface? So, thank you. So yeah, my name is Ryan Jansen, and uh, I'm, uh, I, I do research in uh, the sciences and engineering, and my other self is as a composer of orchestral music. And uh, we've, uh, Steve and I have worked together on a number of projects um, with different kinds of user interfaces. And what I, what I do believe, um, as technology exponentially grows, we need to make sure that it's safe and that it, uh, it, it, it keeps humans in the loop. So it preserves that which is it, integral to human experience. So what is, what is really part of, of the human experience. And we do that by fostering a, a very intimate connection between man and machine. Um, and so we've, we've built a number of these different uh, types of fluid user interfaces. Uh, one example is a type of interface where you, uh, you actually take your fingers or hand into a, a flow of air or water. And what you do is you actually very intricately touch that fluid flow. And by, making, by interacting with the, the turbulent or laminar flow, you can actually really express yourself in, in a very rich way to a machine. Um, and so what we, what we aim to do is to really get a lot of, of tactile information as, as quickly and as richly as possible into a machine and at the same time get information back from the machine to the person in a really, uh, in a really tactile way. And uh, so we've, we've, we've built these hydrolophones. Um, and the, the, the key thing is that, is that you, um, you can really see uh, and, and at the same time feel and even hear what you are doing as an input. So it's, it's feedback to the human. Um, so to really show this, what we actually did was uh, we, build all, we also build some of these instruments, some of these interfaces into musical instruments. So we create acoustic musical instruments that actually use this principle. So it's all about fluid dynamics and it's all about interacting in a, in a very rich way. So this hydrolophone, we actually brought one over here, uh, flew it down from uh, Toronto and uh, got it here, so we're really happy. So you actually, you actually just take your finger and you can just touch in a, in, in a really fluid and intricate way, so you can actually just let the turbulent water flow meander around the tip of your finger, and at the same time, really, uh, really express yourself. So, if you if you look at a flute, a flute has embouchure control. That's the way that the person, the, the player, uh, their their mouth interacts with the mouthpiece to really make an expressive timbre and pitch. 
so that can, they can change those things very carefully. What we do is we actually have that now as the way that the tip of the finger interacts with this, this jet of water coming out of the, 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 the finger hole. And you can do that with many different fingers at the same time. So you can actually play these rich chords that, that actually flow so very gently. That, that you, you can do it so smoothly and continuously that you're, you're not sure when one chord ends and the next one begins. So that's the kind of fluid interface that we that we uh, that we tend to make. And you can play other other sort of things like. So it's a lot of fun to play. Thanks. They're 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 extremely. It's it's a very absorbing experience. And we actually had one time when um, the, the the dean of music at the University of Toronto he actually came over to our lab and he he tried one of these things out and he he called up his secretary and told her to cancel all of his afternoon appointments because he was just going to he he just wanted to sit there and he had this dazed expression in his eyes while he was letting his fingers ride on those water water jets so it's uh, what we what we really do with these interfaces is is make them as uh, as addictive as possible because that's really what it takes to to really feel like you're part of this interface that you're connected with a computer that you can that you can exert your own influence um, on on some kind of system because we th this in itself is is uh, is is an instrument by itself but sometimes we can actually add in hydrophones which are underwater microphones that the kind that oceanographers use to listen to whales uh, and and so we can actually listen to the turbulent sound of the water flow and then pipe that either to, we're actually uh, amplifying it right now, or, or you, could, you could actually use that to determine what's going on with the user input, um, with how, just the intimate way that you uh, touch this thing. So, um, and we've even done um, AI sort of things with figuring out whether the, even characteristics of the water, water's so expressive, you can actually, we, we've been able to f determine computationally whether it's hot water or cold water, what the temperature is, purely based on the sound that it makes. So that just goes to show how, how much you can find through turbulence. And so that's, that's what we're getting out of your fingertip when you touch this thing. So yeah, basically, basically we, uh, as, as, as technology increases in the world around us, we're just trying to, to really reach back to something that's more primal, more primitive, more prim primordial, that's part of the human experience, where we connect science, engineering, and art all at the same time. So, thank you. I'll be back to Steve. So, uh, so yeah, we've built these, we've built a variety of these. Uh, these patents have been issued in multiple countries now, and, and so we're, we're, we're produced a number of these. Um, built, built them, built one into a hot tub, you know, for example. Just showed that to Steve Wozniak recently, and he really loved it. Um, and so the idea, if you think of, of the, the states of matter um, and, and instruments, solid, liquid, gas, you know, previous instruments, strings, percussion, and wind, strings and percussion both make sound from solid matter. Strings are 1D solid, percussion is 2D solid or 3D bulk solid. So the orchestra has three, three sections, solid, solid, and gas. And of course, a piano is both strings and percussion, so it questions that. So you've got to really say that the three sections of the orchestra really should be solid, liquid, and gas. And and uh, of course, you've got your violins and percussions and piano, and then you've got the hydrolophone section, and then of course you've got the wind section. Um, we started a little a little um, company here, and uh, and also here here's a early prototype that's kind of interesting to take a look at. This is a foot-based 
This is an early prototype of my patented hydrolophone invention. It's like a flute, but the finger holes are along a curved path instead of a straight line. And it has 12 or more finger holes usually instead of just seven or eight. But most importantly, it's a water-based instrument that works on water rather than air. And it's powered by one or more water pumps. In the building, we have renewable energy, wind, and solar. Um, these pumps here are connected to this variac. I wouldn't touch this thing with a 10-foot pole if I were standing in that pool, but fortunately pipe comes in 10-foot lengths here, so let me just use this pipe to turn this to the desired voltage, which I can adjust from over there. Now there's water coming from each of the finger holes. We're going to listen to it using an um, underwater listening device called a hydrophone, and our company, Fontaine.ca, is our website. We manufacture these hydrophones ourselves, and so now, if I use this to listen underwater, it's like a flute, but it has a darker, heavier sound. It's hard, it's hard to hear on those, uh, on those speakers because it's mostly subsonic, but um, um, so, uh, so anyway, we, we've built a number of these as public art installations and landmark architecture sites. Here's one we built for the, this landmark architecture site as the main centerpiece out in front of the science center with the pipes arranged in a circle here, and um, there's a picture of it during the daytime. Here's an aerial shot of this uh, uh, sculpture that we built there. And um, here's, I'll play a little video of what it sounds like. You'll notice it's making sound even when nobody's playing it a little bit. The water's whistling through all of the openings all the time. So the notes never begin or end. It's sort of like where does the river start and the stream end. That's an example. By the way, the person who was playing it there, that was the first time they'd ever encountered it because that was opening day and that was just somebody passing by, um, some, somebody randomly passing by. So it's not difficult for people to figure out how to play it. It's very intuitive, very natural. I often ask myself, if I wanted to make a keyboard that would last 10,000 years, what would I do? And I think this is the answer, something along those lines, a kiosk or something timeless. Stainless steel, it's type 316 stainless steel, it's the only thing that would last 10,000 years. Um, and of course, there's no moving parts and there's no, uh, there's no, um, it's fairly easy for somebody to keep it going. Um, so uh, thank, I want to thank everybody for listening. Here's some of the websites on Fluid Media. Our, the main website for our whole group is itap.org slash fluid. Um, itap.org is the website for the itap stuff. h2organ.com is our company that makes a, a version of this for children's toy. We, we sell them to uh, aquatic play. We have them in the water park industry. We're manufactured through Whitewater West in British Columbia in the water park industry. And Fontaine.ca is the other site. We'll have the H2 organ set up tonight at the speaker's event so that everybody can have a chance to try it. Maybe Ryan will play a little bit of, of stuff on it. I can, maybe I'll play a little bit of stuff on it. Anybody else is welcome to to play a little bit on it. Uh, if you know any other instrument, like a piano or a flute, you can play on it. If you don't know any other instrument, you just randomly play it. It sounds pretty good when you randomly play it. 
the children just sit up on top of it and you get three or four kids sitting on it and it still sounds good, you know, clusters. <laughs> Whatever you play, don't be afraid. She doesn't bite. Just, uh, you know, put your fingers on there and, you know, experience this example. I call this the singularity sculpture. It's kind of this, it's it sort of addressing this undigital singularity. All right. Um, you mentioned uh, surveillance was um, something you're worried about and that you came up with surveillance as a result of that. How does surveillance counteract surveillance? You, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I guess one way that I would explain it is that, sur let me just, I'll just draw a little diagram if I may. Um, let, me let me think of a, the ladder of life, I'll say. Imagine we have a ladder here and we've got rungs on the ladder. And we have the chimney sweep down here on the bottom most rung. And uh, if anybody knows Mary Poppins, that's the actual words to the song on the ladder of life. Um, and so there's, there's a, a um, <laughs> bottom most rung. <laughs> And so we have a surveillance camera looking down here at the street, and so people on the street. Now we know if we put surveillance cameras in the east end of town, it'll push crime to the west. That's what they say. It doesn't necessarily actually move the crime physically, but it changes the statistics of crime in the east, and it causes, relatively you have more crime in the west now. So if you put cameras in the east end and the west end, it, it, the crime has nowhere to go but up the rungs of the ladder towards corruption. So I'm not saying... <laughs> And I, I'm not necessarily saying or hypothesizing that, that surveillance causes corruption, but I'm merely saying that if you lock some of the doors, statistically the percentage of crimes in the other doors is going to be more. If you lock the east doors of the building, you're probably going to have, and leave the west doors unlocked, you're probably, crime's probably going to shift to entering from the other doors. So if you lock the street, but you leave corruption unlocked, then, then so surveillance is here on the ladder of life. Now, there's something called oversight which is simply congressional oversight or the police chief looking down, and that's called oversight. And oversight is also looking down the ladder. And so you've got, you've got the police watching the citizens, and then you've got the police chief or the oversight committee watching the police. But then you just push the corruption higher because, you know, now I'm not saying that oversight causes high-level corruption any more than surveillance causes low-level corruption, but it changes the equilibrium and it causes a shift in the equilibrium, which in effect um, uh, makes an opportunity for crime to, to rise up. And so really what you need is to balance that. Let me redraw the ladder of life here. And I'm not suggesting to put cameras on chimney sweeps, but, uh, but now if you put the cameras on people, then what happens is you have some, this is surveillance, and then when you put cameras on high-level officials, I call that undersight. <laughs> so whereas we have surveillance and oversight, we now have surveillance and undersight. And so, by the way, undersight, oversight is just an English translation of the word surveillance, but when you use the French word surveillance, people tend to think of it as lower level, and the English translation of the same word, people usually use it as, as a higher level, like congressional oversight. So that, I, I don't know if I've answered your question or not, or maybe raised more questions, but hopefully I've got you thinking. Thanks. A couple of quick questions. When you have to go to the men's room, could I get a password to your network, please? <laughs> the, the second question is, do you wear that 24 hours? And uh, if not, do you take it off when you sleep or do you wear other devices? And thirdly, which I think we're probably all interested in, oh, did you answer the first one? Oh, good. Um, 
is I've already written down being, the answer to the first the, one. Being the pioneer and the, the first cyborg and the first adopter of this technology, can you share with us your 30-year physiological effects and how you think that'll impact aging? In other words, your, your vision without it? If, did you experience headaches? Have you been monitored physiologically? Thanks. Yeah, so, so some of those questions. The first question, I think, uh, Martine Rothblatt wrote an interesting uh, book kind of talking about this. One of the things that I kind of noticed back in, in the genderification of society, you know, separation, gender-specific spaces, um, I think this is going to be a problem in the future. I talk about it a little bit in my book. Um, think of a situation where you have, uh, as we get older, we have seeing aids, and more and more of us is being going to be replaced by silicon. So as we age, we can already right now replace our brain functions with, with computational memory and we can replace our, our, our seeing with, with, with computational prosthesis. And so this creates a question of what gender am I when if, I, if, my, if, if my wife is helping me see as I get older and my eyesight gets worse and she's guiding me, what gender am I? And what restroom should I use? I mean, that creates an, ob an obvious problem. So I've, I've, I've often thrown this question back to other people. And I think what we're seeing more and more is sort of unisex type washrooms because there's a need for that. The population gets elderly. A lot of people, when they get older, they need help using the toilet. So a husband and wife together, uh, if one of them needs help of the other, even just without the cyborg technology, where do they go? So that problem is p people are becoming aware of that, and it'll be even more so in the cyborg age. So there's, there's a problem there that needs to be addressed. Um, as to the, the physiological uh, effects, I've undergone lots of things. I did an fMRI functional magnetic resonance imaging tests and all kinds of people have been curious about this phenomenology. And um, in, in many ways it's interesting because I think a close parallel is clothing. We've invented clothing and widely adopted it. Um, when people go to a spa where you don't have your clothes on, it's very unnatural. Like, like the natural state is to have clothes on. Um, being naked is not natural, it's unnatural, although the reverse you would expect. If the indigenous peoples, whenever the National Geographic teams would go to interview the indigenous people, their clothes scared them because they'd never seen clothes. So they'd take their clothes off and walk naked into the tribes. They'd lock all their clothes up in their cars and just, just walk in naked the first time because it would freak people out. But after a while, when they discovered clothing, they realized, gee, you know, I can, I can stay up late at night without having to build fire to stay warm. And, you know, the obvious advantage of clothing is, is quickly realized and, and uh, even in the tropics, it does get cold sometimes. And so they immediately gravitate towards that invention. Obviously, clothing is an invention of the cold climates like Canada. You know, you sort of need clothes in Canada, where we're from. But, and here in San Francisco, it's pretty cold and miserable all year round. It's like a refrigerator. <laughs> as the, as the, what was the song says, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. So I, I can't ask a question, but uh, have you ever heard of the theremin? Yes, uh, I, I've built lots of theremins. In fact, I made a water theremin with one jet for volume and another jet for frequency. One of the problems with a the theremin is you've got no tactile feedback. It's never been successful. Uh, you, you notice everybody who has a theremin that I know has it in storage. It's not sitting next to them where they play it. Because it's a gimmick, it's cool, but it doesn't give you tactile feedback. And the nice thing about, I'll, I'll put the hydrolophone on a continuum. Let me say, uh, from nothing, theremin at the origin, which is zero right here, all the way to a piano, which is hard plastic or hard wood, uh, solid. I'd put liquid wonderfully in the middle because it's soft and squishy and it gives you tactile feedback, but yet it gives yeah. it to you. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 And some people, some people have asked us, why, why not put mechanical keys on the, uh, on the water jets because it would make more sense. But really the thing that does make sense is to be able to completely interact with the water directly and, and you get a lot of tactile feedback and it's, it's actually really engaging to play. So thanks very much thanks and so much. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be around. So uh, and we'll, we'll, you'll be able to try this out. So.